Hey, good morning, church. You know, I love it. God is so faithful. Said in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our, our daily bread. This is my third message out of five, and walk in here after harvest has already started, and daily bread found me at my seat. Someone left me a Gatorade right there, so thank you. Manna just falling all around us. I got here early this morning and um, just walked into the church and, you know, trying to get in before the humidity collapsed my hair and... And uh, got this picture of just the, the sunrise, and I, can't, I just can't stop thinking about Lamentations, where the writer reminds us that his mercies are new every day in these words, great is thy faithfulness. God is faithful, amen. I'm thankful that you are here. Welcome to you in this place, to those of you who are watching online today. All right, quick question. Um, what's, uh, what, what's the honeymoon period for a new senior pastor? Asking for a friend. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been in the church. I'm not new to the United Methodist Church. Um, it does it kind of shock some people when I say this is my first pastoral appointment. Fun. But I've been in the United Methodist Church for actually over two decades, 26 years this summer. And it's interesting because I, I tell people that I am a senior pastor today who has been taking notes of every senior pastor that I have been working for over the past 25 years. I've gleaned some really good observations. There are some, just a few things I would probably do a little bit differently. But one of the things that's at the top of my list, lessons learned from watching senior pastors is this, number one on the legal pad, don't change anything the first year that you're senior pastor, anything. So here we are talking about denominational disaffiliation. You can imagine. I've reminded the Lord, but this is what I've learned. But because God is so faithful, he reminded me, this is month 13. So we're okay. It's not the, still, not an easy topic. Not an easy message to, uh, to bring. Um, I love that uh, Facebook memories just a couple of weeks ago, there was a picture that, that popped up. It, it was this one. Um, this was the passing of the mantle service that we had back in June. Anybody remember that? That was, uh, it's hard to believe that that was a year ago. And I was looking at this picture, and first off, just look how young I was back then. Amazing. <laughs> just that smile on my face, the Shekinah glory of the Lord. I'm just holding on to it in that moment. But I also love, Dr. Rob is just so serious. Look at that serious face. You know what's changed today? I seem to be a little more serious. You have never seen Dr. Rob smile more over these past several months. He's like Benjamin Buttons. He's de-aged by 10 years. It's incredible. Has me looking forward to retirement. But what he loves to do to me lately is he loves to come up to me and say, hey, I'm so glad you're the senior pastor of the church. <laughs> I receive it. But what I love is actually he doesn't stop there. He says, I'm so glad you're the senior pastor of the church because he said, young man, you're the one God has called to lead the church for such a time as this. And he says, we're with you. So, there's no question, there's no question that this is a really challenging season of ministry, but I have never been more hopeful about the future of our church. So what I want to do today is I want to tell you why I believe now is the time for us to move forward in faith. Not backwards in fear. That just doesn't have a catchy title to it, does it? Backwards in fear. Not backwards in fear, forward in faith. Not, not stationary. <laughs> not just standing here with our, with our eyes closed and our, our fingers crossed, just hoping all of the issues that we've had within the denomination that we've just been wrestling with and, and bruising the name of Jesus over for the past few years, that it's going to get better 
No, no, church, now's the time to move forward in faith. I want to bring a message from the book of Acts. I want to talk about a difficult moment in the life of the church, but yet fruit and something beautiful that happened that I truly believe speaks into this moment where we are. I want to talk about why I think now is the time to leave the denomination. I want to give you the date that we're going to have a church-wide vote, but, but more than anything, I, I don't want to shy away from this moment. I want you to hear my heart, and I want to speak both truth and grace today. So would you do me a favor anytime I open up the word and I, I teach from the scriptures? I love to pray. If you know me, if you know our church, you know that about me. Um, I'd love to invite you. Would you just open up your hands and just place, them, just place them in front of you, palms up? I say in the charismatic meter, this is about a three, not that big, not that big. You can do this. But this is just, uh, this is just an expression uh, for me when I pray. There's times that as I just pray, I open my hands just to say, God, I want to receive what you have for me in this moment. Because I believe you can't brush up against the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come into this place and leave the same. He's always speaking new things. So let's just, let's just pray in this moment, and then I'll, I'll, I'll jump into the word. Great is thy faithfulness. Father, God, I'm so thankful, I'm thankful that in this season, right here, right now, that Lord, you are here, you're here. That whoever, whether in this space, whether watching online, that that God, the same one who was with us on the mountaintop is the same one that stands with us in the valley. The same one, Jesus, who would look at the wind and the waves and say, be still, is the same one who breathed the Spirit over his disciples and said, peace be with you. God, you're a giver of peace. And Father, I have just such a cry right now that you would be present with us in this moment. That you would be with all of those churches right now that are having these conversations, that we would lean in to what you are saying, that we would be true to the communities of those you have called us to shepherd and to lead. Jesus, you said it in this world. There'll be trouble. There'll be hardships. But you also said, take heart, for I have overcome the world. So you're the vine, we're the branches. Apart from you, we can't do a thing, but with you, all things are possible. So may we be a people so connected to the vine that the very fruit of the Spirit, that we would be the very aroma of Christ to a world in need. It's a big prayer, but you're an even bigger God. So Lord, we receive hands open and we say, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And God's people said, amen, amen, thank you. Hey, if you have your Bible, let's go. Acts chapter 15 is where I, want to, uh, where I want to preach from today. So let me give you a little bit of context. I never just want to assume that, that everybody here is, is up to speed when we talk about the Gospels or we talk about Acts, just a brief, little, a brief little 411. So the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we call them the Synoptic Gospels. And basically they are four accounts, autobiographies, four perspectives of Jesus and the time that he walked on this earth, who he was was, how God went to such lengths to step off of his throne, imagine it, wrap himself in flesh and show us his nature. The gospel writers tell us that Jesus went to a cross knowingly and obediently, why? So that he could become the sacrificial lamb, become an atonement for sins, And we know that he was crucified, dead, and buried, but we also know, spoiler alert, the grave could not contain him. That he overcame, that he is risen. All of the gospels tell us this story of a risen, victorious Jesus. Now, what I love about Acts, which is the fifth book of the New Testament, is that Luke, who wrote the gospel Luke, I love that Luke keeps writing. And that's the book of Acts. 
Acts is the story of Jesus, Acts 1, looking at his followers saying, listen, I want you to go back to Jerusalem. Don't do a thing until the Holy Spirit comes. They say, how are we going to know? Jesus says, oh, you're going to know. And we call it Pentecost. Pentecost is the day the believers, they gather in that upper room and the Spirit comes with power. And Jesus said, when the Spirit comes, it will come with power, and you will be my disciples in all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And what happens after that first service where the Spirit comes, Peter would present the gospel, 3,000 people would go into the water, be baptized, come out as followers of Jesus, and the church that we know today did this. (sighs) She took her first breath. She took her first breath. And what you find all throughout the New Testament then from Acts, the story of Acts, it's the story of the church becoming the church. The story of these early believers in first century that find themselves in such a, such a, a, a difficult situation that there was persecution. If you follow Jesus, you had persecution. You had all these Roman like influences and these pagan gods. And, and what Paul begins to do, the apostle Paul, he had a past, but Paul gives his life to Jesus. His life is never the same again. And what Paul does is Paul begins this missionary journey of going into different communities, establishing churches, and what Paul loves to do is follow up with those churches and encourage them. Why? He wants to make sure that these churches are biblically sound. Because with When you're in a culture where there's all these pagan ideas and and different philosophies and religions, if you're not careful, it can really dilute, water down who Jesus was and who Jesus has called us to be. So Paul has been on his first missionary journey in Acts 15. He's now about to go back to encourage the believers, to hold the line, remind them who Jesus was. Right? We, um, we say in the Methodist church, this is sanctification. We're moving on to holiness. Paul is doing sanctification here. Translation, Paul was Methodist. Who knew? You're welcome. <laughs> now, Paul, just before he leaves, encounters a problem. Let's hear it together. Starting in verse 36. Sometime later, Paul and Barnabas said... Let's go back and visit the believers in all of the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and let's see how they're doing. Follow up with them. Now Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. There's the problem. And they had such a sharp disagreement. Say disagreement. Disagreement. That word in the Greek right there is the same Greek word that we get the word contention for. So they had, not a little one, but they had such a sharp, big disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. Let me read it again. It's so important you hear this. Barnabas took Mark, sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. And he, Paul, went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I know it, I know what you're thinking. Wait, 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 wait. People disagree in the church? Wait, this happens? Yes. Apparently, for 2,000 years, this has been happening. Isn't it amazing? Like, this is really, um, it's a hard story. Because all of this is over John Mark. We we don't don't know, really, the context, but we know this. Paul was on a, a missionary journey, that very first one, and when the going got tough, John Mark went home. He just turned around, really, I I think this is about spiritual maturity. John Mark was just at a place where when the going got tough, he was ready to go back to mom, and he left. And here they find themselves, Paul and Barnabas about to leave. Barnabas is like, hey, let's take John Mark. And Paul says, no. 
Now, the challenge is, here you have two men of God, Paul and Barnabas. Both of them filled with the Spirit, but both of them passionate about their perspective. Barnabas is an encourager. Barnabas is filled with hope. But Paul, Paul knew his mission. Paul knew where he was going, and he knew in his gut that the Spirit was saying, on this one, John Mark is not headed in that direction. Church, we need Barnabases in the world, but we also need Paul's. We also need those who are true and faithful to where God is calling them and willing to go when they know it's the right direction that they're being called. Now is the time to move forward in faith. We know our mission. We know who we are. And I truly believe our greatest days are ahead. And that's why we find ourselves, I, I tell people things in the United Methodist Church have just gotten heated so quickly. I mean, my hope was that we could get to general conference, kind of our deciding board where it was supposed to happen in August, next month. And the hope was at general conference, we were all going to come together and we could just agree that now is the time to just exit. But in January, where we thought General Conference was in August this year, things got moved early February. It got bumped to 2024. And let me tell you something. We went from a crock pot to an instapot in the United Methodist Church. <laughs> things really started heating up very quickly. And that's why we're in this period of denominational discernment. So what are we talking about? There's three steps here that we're walking through as a community of faith, and I think it's so pivotal and so important that we understand where we are in this process. Step number one is disaffiliation. It's disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church. Now, you need to hear this. We are not Lone Rangers in this. We're not. Grieves me to say that right now, today, 2022, there are over a thousand churches that are in the process of disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church. Do you know in our own Texas annual conference, hear this, right here in our own backyard, in our own Texas annual conference, there are over 200 churches, literally one third of the United Methodist churches in our conference are in this period of denominational discernment pursuing disaffiliation within the denomination. Step number one is just to disaffiliate. Now, we'll talk about that date. We'll talk about when that is in just a moment. After disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church, we move into another season. I think this is a hopeful season and an exciting season. This is a season of discernment. You know how we... How we opened our hands, how we, we prayed. We just said, okay, Lord, what do you have? Well, on the other side of disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church, we enter this period to say, okay, Lord, where are we gonna go? Is it the global Methodist Church? Now, some people think we've already joined the GMC. We have not joined the GMC. That formed on May the 1st, but we haven't joined the GMC. Are we going to join the GMC? I don't know. That's step number two. We're just in step number one. But what I want to do in step number two is talk about, okay, discernment. Where is it? Is it the GMC? Maybe. A lot of Methodist churches right now are going into the free Methodist church. I want you to hear me. I'm not going to slide anything under the rug. You're not going to wake up one morning and find you're a part of a new denomination and you didn't even know it was happening. No. We're going to enter a period of discernment. We're going to talk about that. We're going to just open our hands and say, okay, where are we going? And then you get to step number three, which is affiliation. That's that moment. Whenever that moment is, we don't want to rush it, but that's the moment where we align ourselves theologically with the denomination that aligns with where we are. Who are we? We are Wesleyan. We are Orthodox. Now, 44 years ago, when Ed Robb and his wife Bev came into a little community 
known as the Woodlands, Texas. It's amazing. Nine years ago this weekend, my wife and I moved to the Woodlands, Texas to start this new job. Felt like the Beverly Hillbillies driving out of Shreveport, Louisiana, coming here. I bet Dr. Rob Bev felt the same way 44 years ago, driving into this community to start a church. What did he start? He started a Methodist church. We have been a Methodist church for 44 years. Listen to me. On my watch, we will continue to be a Methodist church for the next 44 years. Why? Because this is who we are. That's not going to change. There's a quote that has been so convicting to me. Listen. I have just prayed over this season. I've been joining other members of our clergy team, some of you fasting over this season. I just wanna, I wanna lead well. But there's a quote that's been such a conviction to me that has really given me such a confidence to stand in this season. And this quote, it's not a recent quote, it's from a guy by the name of John Wesley. Have you heard of him? He's a bit of a big deal in the Methodist Church. Now, you know the United Methodist Church, some people don't even know this. Some think the United Methodist Church has been around for hundreds of years. Not the case at all. The United Methodist Church is just a little older than I am. Now, Methodists, we've been around for hundreds of years. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said this. Listen, tell me if this isn't prophetic. He said, I'm not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America, but I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect having the form of religion, but without the power. (laughs) He says, and this will undoubtedly be the case unless they hold fast both the doctrine, spirit, and the discipline with which they first set out. You hear what he's saying? He's saying 200 years ago, he says, listen, it's not my fear that Methodists in America that they're gonna cease to exist. I think they'll be fine. But John Wesley said, this is what I'm just a little worried about, that they're going to have the appearance of religion but they're gonna be void of the power. And then he said, this is how it's gonna happen. If they move away from doctrine, from spirit, and from discipline. Let me tell you something about your church. We're a church that's about doctrine, spirit, and discipline. We're a church that holds to our doctrine, to the word of God, who God is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit came to show us we are called to be. We're about doctrine. We're about spirit, the spirit that unites us, but we are also about discipline. We're about holding the line. When culture begins to water down the blood of Jesus, we're not going to give way. We're gonna stand in our doctrine, spirit, and discipline. And church, the United Methodist Church is moving away from doctrine, spirit, and discipline. Now's the time. Why should we leave the United Methodist Church? Couple things. Number one, I believe the power of the gospel is lost. I do. I do. Now listen. What seems to make the headlines here (laughs) is that this is all about sexuality. And there's no question we have been wrestling with that. We have been wholly conferencing over that for years. But I want to tell you, There's so much more. This is about basic doctrinal theology that is no longer held in the UMC. How many of you remember 2020? Anyway, what do you know? Better way. How many of you are ready to forget 2020? (laughs) There's the hands. Yeah, yeah. 2020 was just so challenging and difficult. You know, I think what Dr. Rob really is doing is he's just paying it forward. 
I mean, as many times now as he says, I'm so glad you're the senior pastor, I went up to him about 20 times in 2020 and I said, I am so glad you are the senior pastor. Why? Because there was no decision that you could make as a pastor in 2020 that everybody was gonna be excited about. No decision at all. If you didn't have thick skin in 2020, praise the Lord, nothing's getting under the skin now because it was such a heated time. So many people were moving away from the church and I'll tell you, masks was a big, did you know masks was a big debate in 2020? I had to keep like a neck brace in my office. One day I got an email from someone, true story, nine o'clock in the morning, they said, Pastor, either you mandate masks in the church or we're moving our membership and we're leaving. Four hours later, someone sent me an email, different person, and said, Pastor, if you don't mandate masks, we're pulling our membership and our families leaving your church. I mean, holy whiplash, there it is. And I had such a burden that, I mean, just masks, for example. People are, are walking away from communities of faith based over these conversations of masks. And I was coming in to preach in the fall of 2020. I'm never gonna forget it. Some of you may remember it happened here in Harvest. One thing I always do anytime I preach is I always, it sounds crazy, I always ask the Lord, I say, would you give me prophecy? And, and, and why I say that is like, Lord, if you give me an image, a name, if you give me a picture, whatever you tell me, even if it doesn't make sense, I'm, I'm, I wanna honor that, I wanna do it. So I always pray for prophecy before I come up on this stage. And I'm driving to church that morning and I felt the word of God tell me, Mark, do the apostles' creed. It's so weird. I mean, I, mm, I should say this. The Apostles' Creed is not weird. I love the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> we don't always do that here in the harvest, though. But I couldn't shake it. And I didn't understand why. There's times I come up here and I'll do things, the Lord, and I don't always understand why. But I was obedient. And I remember, some of you may remember. I said, how many of you remember the Apostles' Creed? Hands went up. I said, anybody know what hymn number it was? Some lady in the front row. I mean, right on point. United Methodist Hymnal, number 881. And I said, let's do the Apostles' Creed. And everybody stood up, and we did the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, and, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I, I loved it. And after we were finished, I was like, yes! And we sat down. And then I knew what the Spirit was doing. And I took a mask out of the back of my pocket and I said, can you believe people are walking away from the church over this? Conversations over masks. Now listen, you can come into this place with questions. That's the beauty of church. It's the beauty of what we do. But the truth is, if, if you have a problem with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, if you question the Trinity, if you doubt that Jesus was really the Messiah, the power of the Holy Spirit, if you have a problem with the basic doctrines of the faith, then I need to tell you, Houston, we have a problem. In the United Methodist Church, basic doctrinal beliefs are not being held. There are pastors that deny the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. There is a bishop who believes that Jesus is not the Messiah. No, 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 no. Just a really good person, but that whole Messiah thing actually came in the first century, but it's not true. My word. There, there are pastors that don't even have a cross in their sanctuary anymore. Specifically, they don't like talking about the sacrifice of Jesus, the blood of the lamb. Why? Because it guilts people. They don't need more guilt in their life. What's happening? What's happening? In our own Texas annual conference, right here in the Board of Ordained Ministry, there's some paperwork that's gone before the board, new ordinance that are coming in, clergy that are coming in. The paper says, no longer use masculine pronouns in relationship to God, meaning we can't say father anymore in church. 
We can't say father anymore in church. Do you realize this is new? I didn't know this. Already churches aren't using kingdom anymore. They're saying kingdom. Come on. Church. Will someone tell me this? How do you pray the Lord's Prayer and not say our Father? How do you do it? We're losing our way. It grieves me. It pains me. Paul, 2 Timothy says this. <laughs> You're going to find that there will be times when people will have no stomach for solid teaching but will fill up on spiritual junk food, catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. <laughs> and by the way, not King James. This is the message translation. Just go with me. <laughs> Context is still good, and it's on point. He said they're going to they're gonna turn their backs on truth, and they're going to chase after mirages. But you... Keep your eye on what you're doing. You accept the hard times along with the good. Keep the message alive and do a thorough job as God's servant. I'm telling you, power of the gospel is lost. But not just that. Why I think it's also time to leave is because I truly believe the United Methodist Church is just a broken system with no accountability. Now, we have a book of discipline. Discipline, how we interpret the scriptures. We abide as bishops and district superintendents and clergy. We abide by our book of discipline. And I'm here to tell you, the book of discipline in the United Methodist Church is solid. It's strong. There's no problems with the book of discipline. Here's the issue that we have. Bishops and DSs and clergy that are disavowing our book of discipline. They're doing whatever they want to do, and there's no accountability. Bishops, DSs, clergy that make an oath, make a vow to say, we are going to uphold the book of discipline, no longer see it as valid, so they're going to do whatever they want to do. We've been debating this for a long time. There's no accountability anymore. Listen, we're tired. We're tired of the disobedience. We're tired of the defiance. Now is the time to bless one another and say, this is who this is who we are. Our own bishop, Scott Jones, bishop of the Texas Annual Conference, my word, so thankful for this man. He's where we are, Orthodox and Wesleyan, and he's been fighting this fight as a bishop for us for a long time. In fact, one of the few bishops in the country that actually is allowing churches in the Texas Annual Conference to have a gracious exit. Wherever you are, and, and there's no mud, there's no trash talking. He's like, we just want to bless you if you feel now is the time to stay or now is the time to leave. In fact, you know, actually to disaffiliate from the church, we'll actually be able to retain our property. This will be our property that's been trapped in a trust clause in the United Methodist Church for a long time. We'll actually have our property. It's amazing. But our own bishop, Scott Jones, who's been fighting this fight, just worn down, is retiring December the 31st of this year. Why? Broken system with no accountability. Church, the denomination over the past 50 years has lost 45% of its membership. It's time. Power of the gospel is lost. Broken system, no accountability. But lastly, this is such a conviction for me. There's not a place for a traditional voice at the table. There's not. I mean, call, call me naive, but I, I actually believe that you can sit across from someone who doesn't believe what you believe, okay? And you see scripture one way, and I see scripture another way, and I actually believe that you can still sit at the table and you can love each other and recognize that there's more that brings you together than what separates you, but the issues we're facing today is there's just not a place for a traditional voice at the table. A couple months ago, our my executive leadership team, we got an opportunity to go to another large church comparable to the size of our church, and 
meet with a pastor whom I call a friend and who I love. And we were sitting together, and he's not really where we are theologically, but um, we were talking about the denomination and where our churches are and just how difficult this season was. And he said, you know, Mark, my, my hope is that you would continue to stay in the UMC. He said, I feel like so much of what I'm doing is just trying to hold these two sides together and just hold it together as best I can. And there was a a pause in the moment. Mark Swayze was with me there. And Swayze actually said to this pastor, can I ask you a question? He said, when are you retiring? Now I'm thinking, well, that's rude. I mean, I I don't. (laughs) And I'm in the middle. It's fun. So he's here and this pastor's here. And I so, you know, pull out the popcorn and just, okay, this is... (laughs) And this pastor looked at Mark and he said, well, um, I don't know, within 10 years. And Mark said, I have 30. He said, right now, I have young people in the youth group at the Woodlands Methodist that have surrendered to a call to ministry. They have 30, 40 50 years, he said, where is their voice going to be in the denomination? And it hits me. This isn't just about now. Sure, we could continue to do this, but this is about the future. It's about ensuring that our young people have a place to stand and to openly say, our Father who art in heaven, and not be corrected. That's what we're talking about. That's why, it's why we're at this moment. And here's the grace. Hear me, this is where I am. I actually think something beautiful is happening here. Because when Paul and Barnabas had this disagreement and they decide to bless one another and to go their separate ways, the church of Antioch said, may the grace of God go before you, Barnabas. May the grace of God go ahead of you, Paul. This is an opportunity to look at the United Methodist Church and genuinely say, My prayer is that grace of God would go ahead of you. Paul, what I love is right after that hard moment, it gets back to the mission. Paul went on encouraging the believers. No, it doesn't say that Paul went on trash-talking Barnabas on why he was so wrong. Paul didn't go on trash-talking Barnabas, dragging his name through the mud, proving his point as to why he was right. No, after that moment, after the grace of God went before them, Paul got back to the mission of who he was. This is about the future of the Woodlands Methodist Church. This is about preserving our mission. You know it, winning people to Jesus, discipling them in faith, and helping those in need. We are a church. Your church is a church over the past 44 years that has carried the gospel into 62 countries, and we are not finished proclaiming good news around the world. We're not. We have more, church. Your church is a leader of Wesleyan faith with one of the largest congregations, my word, in the community. We are a church that's about investing in the next generation. Maybe a good reminder, go back to January, that state of the church where we talked about the visions over the next three to five years, launching two to three new worshiping communities. We're working on that right now, raising up a thousand next generation leaders. This is about continuing to advance the kingdom of God. We know our mission, and now is the time. So that's why. On August the 7th, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm inviting you to join me here in the sanctuary and vote to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. Fun fact, August the 7th, 
my wife and I's 29th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary, honey. It's... I'm still taking her to dinner afterwards. Now, hear this, hear this. There's the date. I know you have a lot of questions. I hear it, I hear it, I hear it. At the conclusion of the service today, you're gonna see a video that features uh, uh, Mark Hanley, who's our, our chairperson of the trustees, and Jessica Jones, who is on our finance committee. I, I'm so thankful for our governance boards. I'm so thankful for our leaders. I've just been praying and discerning alongside so many of you. So I know you have questions about the vote. You're gonna see a video that's gonna answer a lot of those questions. If you haven't been to twmc.org forward slash affiliation, um, that website just continues to evolve and grow. We continue to add things there. So on our church website, information about the vote is there. It went live this weekend. Gonna answer all those questions. Also, let me say this. I know this is hard. I just, I wanna lead with integrity and transparency. And it was important for me to give you an opportunity to ask questions. Because I, th I think there's, there's something beautiful when we can see each other face to face, right? And you can ask me a question and I can see your face and then I can answer and you can see my face. I continue to say, like, I, email's not always the best way to correspond over these greater issues. Like, I genuinely don't know when you're typing to me in all caps if your caps button is broken. Like, I have so many questions when that happens. So in your, in, your, in your worship bulletin, there are five community forums that we are hosting. Just continue to pray for me. I'm gonna need a lot more Gatorade. A lot of your leaders are, but we're, uh, we're having five community forums over the next seven, 10 days leading up to the vote for that, uh, for that moment, for you to be able to come to ask questions. In a 30 to 40 minute sermon, I can't give you all of the, all the context, everything you need to know, but it's just a place to go a little bit deeper. Look, here's the, here's the truth. Um, I didn't choose this. But I do believe this moment chose me. And there was the temptation. You better believe there was the temptation to just be silent. To just say, you know what? Next senior pastor can deal with this, but it's not time to be silent. It's not time to be small, and I blame Etsy. <laughs> I thought it was a good idea when I became senior pastor. So filled with life. I thought it'd be a good idea to get a little sign. I've talked about this. It sits in my office. Preach to be faithful. Not popular. That's a gift. I feel like a year ago when I didn't even know God was saying, you need, you need to be reminded of this every single day. Church, this may not be popular. I understand. I know right now, no doubt, somewhere in the social media world, my name is connected to what's happening and it's not a popular tweet. It's not a popular perspective. But here's where I am. I'm the senior pastor of the Woodlands Methodist Church. I'm not a senior pastor of a church in Florida. I'm not a senior pastor of a church in Dallas, a church in California. I don't know how they're leading their churches. I pray that they know their communities, that they know their congregations, but I am a pastor of the Woodlands Methodist Church, and this is about our mission. This is about who we are, preserving our mission and knowing this is a season to go where the Lord is calling us to go. Isaiah, yes, come on. <laughs> Dr. Rob said, that passing of the mantle service, he said, you know, there were a lot of things I wanted to accomplish before the new senior pastor came in. Well, let me tell you what he accomplished. He accomplished 43 years of integrity. He accomplished 43 years of leading this church, of holding the line, 43 years of retiring without a moral failure. May it be said of me in another 20 years, 25 years. May it be said that this was a time that I didn't compromise. 
that I was faithful for where the Lord had called me to serve, that we as a people were bold. It's time to move forward in faith. Isaiah 43, God said to the people who found themselves in Babylonian captivity, by the way, you can be in Babylon and not compromise who you are. But God said to the people then who were looking back, they weren't looking forward at a new thing. They were looking back. God said this. He said, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. That's equivalent to you driving down I-45 in the rear view mirror. It ain't going to end well, church. Why? Because there is a much bigger windshield that's in front of you. God said, now's the time. Stop looking back. Stop lamenting. Here's what you do. (laughs) See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Church, here is to the new thing. Here is to where God is calling us to go. Here is to the future to the thousand next generation leaders, to the explosion of the churches that are gonna be launched, not to grow our empire, but to continue to advance the kingdom of God. May he be given the glory, may he be given the honor, and may he be given the praise. Come on. Yes. And God's people said, amen. All right, here's what's about to happen. Stay standing. We're going to sing a closing song. I'm going to go to my office and lay down. I'm tired. (laughs) I'm going to do this again in the sanctuary with much nicer shoes. But um, thank you for your encouragement. I just, it's a joy. I look out. I see your faces. I'm so thankful to serve alongside of people that I love. I'm thankful for who you are. Let's continue to pray, open hands and discern where God is calling us to go. Amen, amen. God bless you, love you, church.